Thomas Barnett. He basically said the following. He said, under corporate globalization of the world economy, every country is going to have a different role, a different job. He said, and our job in America will be security exports. He said, we're not going to build things anymore. We're not going to make shoes. We're not going to make clothes. We're not going to make televisions. We're not going to make refrigerators. We're not going to make many cars. We're not going to really produce steel. Our job is going to be security export. It makes no sense for corporations to hire people here in this country, paying union wages and all that kind of stuff, when we can go overseas to Indonesia or China or India and pay people at basically darn near slave wages. Better they maximize profits internationally and we do what we're good at. We become the military arm of corporate globalization. That's Bruce Gagnon speaking about the deadly connection, endless war, and the ecological economic crisis. Bruce Gagnon is coordinator for the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. This is a program by Global Voices for Justice. I'm Jeannie Kyle. Global Voices for Justice is a nonprofit media organization in Long Beach, California. Our mission is to make the voices of today's independent thinkers accessible to everyone. To request a copy of this program on DVD or to support our work, please visit our website at gvfj.org or globalvoicesforjustice.org. If this talk inspires or motivates you, consider making a donation to the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space and also to Global Voices for Justice to help make it possible for us to continue publishing programs like this that will broaden your knowledge on important issues and offer insights on how to solve today's problems. Thanks for your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you all very much. It's great to be here, and I want to thank Chris and Randy for their extraordinary efforts. They not only organized this uh, event tonight, but they organized a whole week-long uh, uh, series of events. F started two days ago in San Diego, and I'm working my way north all the way to Bellingham, Washington. 30 days, 24 cities. I thought about printing up rock and roll t-shirts, you know, <laughs> with the city names on the back, but uh, anyway. But it's, it's great to be here and, and uh, really wonderful uh, turnout. So thanks to everyone. Um, I'm gonna start by telling you a few stories about myself, just so you know uh, more about me, and then I'll get into uh, the work. Uh, I grew up in a military family. My uh, stepfather was in the Air Force. Uh, my whole, basically my whole life. My mother married him when I was two, so we spent our, all of our time traveling around the world, living on various military bases. And in 1968, we were living in northwest Florida, the panhandle of Florida, where they say it's so conservative there that they actually call it Lower Alabama. <laughs> and there I had my first organizing experience, working on the Nixon campaign. I was the vice chair of the Okaloosa, Florida uh, County Young Republican Club. And I did such a good job working on the Nixon campaign that they organized a fish fry fundraiser right before the election. And they asked me to sit at the head table that evening with their honored speaker, someone that most of you have probably heard of. He died a few years ago, uh, former Senator Strom Thurmond from South Carolina. <laughs> Oh, oh, what's the matter? What? <laughs> Why do you say, oh? Uh, well, and then kind of from there, it sort of went just downhill after that. And in 1971, uh, we, by this time, we, uh, my uh, father was transferred to uh, Beale Air Force Base in Northern California, north of Sacramento, where the SR-71 spy plane was, and he was working on the cameras. And uh, I graduated from uh, Wheatland High School. And then uh, right soon after, tried to join the Air Force, so was sent to the Oakland Induction Center, where I proceeded to flunk my induction physical because of an old high school football injury. So when most people of good sense were trying to stay out of the military, 
because they didn't want to go to Vietnam, I had to get a waiver to get in. And so uh, I got my waiver, and after my training, I was sent to a base in California, Travis Air Force Base, that during that time uh, still remains a, a major airlift base. And that time, GIs would come from all over the country to get on the planes to go to Vietnam. And when the planes would return, they would bring the body bags of the dead soldiers and many, many, many uh, wounded people as well. And the day I checked into my barracks, uh, they looked in what's called the orderly room. They looked down this clipboard and they said to me, oh my God, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry. We only have one room left. And get your bags, follow me. And uh, we walked down this long, dark hallway. And it was last door on the left. And the guy kept apologizing to me. Really, we'll get you out of here as soon as we can. And I really thought it would be like a, a broom closet with a cot in it. And we walked in, and there were anti-war posters all over the wall. And as it turned out, it was the leading GI resistance movement organizer in the barracks. And they were keeping them isolated because they were trying to keep, uh, kick them out. They didn't have enough goods on them yet, so it was taking some time. But then they ran out of rooms, and then they forgot about me. So at night, there was a knock on the door, and white guys would come in with chairs, and they would sit in a circle and talk about the war in Vietnam. And I'm sitting in the corner, this young Republican for Nixon from a military family, <laughs> thinking these got to be communists, right? Another night, there was a knock on the door, and it was black guys from the cities, Black, Panther, black Panthers coming to talk about racism in the military and around the country. And again, I'm sitting in the corner thinking, these are definitely communists. <laughs> And then they started smoking marijuana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had heard of it before. I, I had heard of it. But you know, remember, I lived on military bases behind the barbed wire fences. So, uh, and and I, I promise you, I swear to God, I never inhaled. I never did. <laughs> but I think it was the secondhand smoke. You know, we've learned over the years that secondhand smoke can have an effect on very innocent people. And so it had some kind of an effect on me, I think. And uh, eventually my chair moved into their circle. I began reading their newsletters and participating in their conversations. And after about six months, I decided that I was a conscientious objector and I asked if I could be released from the military. And their answer to me was, well, what's your family history? Were you uh, from a, a traditional peace church, a Quaker, a Mennonite, Church of the Brethren, something like that? And my answer, of course, was no, not really. I came from a military family, and I worked on the Nixon campaign. And so they turned me down. <laughs> and so I ended up doing three and a half years of what I called hard time in the military, because after I figured out what was going on, it was extremely hard for me to be there. Uh, but uh, I, I, I uh, anyway, anyway, when I got out, I uh, w went back to Florida, where my family had retired. and. Uh, I was going to college at the University of Florida, just ready to graduate when I got recruited by the United Farm Workers Union to become an organizer of fruit pickers in Florida for the union. So I quit college, never to return. And uh, I was brought to California to La Paz, the, the headquarters of the UFW where I was trained and, uh, and then sent back to Florida. And from there I moved into other social justice organizing. And then by the time Ronald Reagan became president and he was doubling the military budget, uh, I was seeing the social programs were being destroyed and uh, also the military could be uh, increased. So I decided that uh, I needed to work on uh, military and I've been doing it ever since. For 15 years, I was the state coordinator of the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice. And in 1992, we uh, saw that the space program in our state <clears throat> was uh, growing rapidly into a, uh, into a serious uh, a new arms race in space. And we worked with uh, folks in Colorado, a local group called Citizens for Peace in Space. Uh, us from Florida and them in uh, Colorado were really the only two uh, groups in the country on a local level that were working around these issues. So we created the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space in 92. So this, this year it's our 20th year. And, uh, and uh, there we go. Um, I, I want to talk to you about, about the military-industrial complex as a criminal syndicate. When I was a kid, I wanted to fight organized crime. I decided that I wanted to be a, 
a crime fighter. And I decided that I wanted to join the FBI to do that. And because I was a Boy Scout and we were taught be prepared, I thought I'd get a head start on everybody else. So I sent away for this FBI correspondence course. And I learned that everyone has a different fingerprint. And I learned about FBI definitions. And the one I most remember was MO. Every criminal has an MO, a modus operandi, a way of working. Well, I want to tell you a story about the military industrial complex criminal syndicates MO. And I want to start with South Dakota, where we moved when I was going into fourth grade in the middle of a blizzard in the winter. And I saw the homes of these suffering people that had to be freezing to death inside of these homes as we arrived into Rapid City, South Dakota late one evening. What I called shotgun shacks, you know, houses with holes in them, and you know the people inside are freezing to death. Well, come to find out these were the Lakota people, the Sioux Indians. And so I became consumed with reading everything I could about Indian culture and Indian history. And this uh, really has brought me, I believe, to where I am today. It has much to do with it. But at the end of the Civil War, the Civil War where the weapons corporations made a lot of money, by making a lot of weapons that really didn't work at times, uh, they found that as the Civil War was over, there was kind of a slowdown in their, in their uh, business, as you can imagine. But the Indian Wars were still going on out in the Dakotas and also in Texas where the Comanches were being rounded up. But they were pretty much wrapping that up, as in, especially in the Dakotas, all the bands were brought onto reservations now with the exception of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. But in 1877, even uh, Crazy Horse uh, came onto the reservation. And the reason why was because his people were starving to death. As the whites were entering the Black Hills, especially the gold miners, uh, and bringing uh, other settlers in, uh, they were killing most of the game. The buffalo were being destroyed as the trains, uh, as the rail system was moved westward. They invented new high-powered uh, rifles. Uh, that they were using to fire from the trains to destroy buffalo, leaving them rotting on the uh, prairie side. And the people were starving. So against their better judgment, both Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull came onto the reservation. And the deal was that they had to give up their guns and they had to give up their horses. So virtually their entire way of life. But they were promised that they would be taken care of by the federal government as long as the grass grew green. And so what happened was the corporations that were given money by the federal government to buy them food and blankets and clothing began to cheat them. And they, bought little thin, uh, they brought them little thin blankets that would not keep them warm in the winter. You know, they were used to the buffalo hides, you can imagine. Uh, and so these thin blankets uh, were a very, uh, a very poor quality. And then the bacon was rancid and the flour had bugs in it. And so the people were still starving at this point in time. But again, the weapons corporations were not happy. And so they brought together a team of artists and writers, and they had the artists make renderings of Crazy Horse back on the warpath, killing innocent white people as they were coming out in their wagon trains, raping white women. And then they had writers fabricate stories about the raids that Crazy Horse and his band were doing against the whites. And they planted these in all the newspapers, in the major newspapers, across the country. And the American people were outraged and called on the Congress of the United States to do something to bring these savages back onto the reservation and in control. And of course, the Congress swung into action, appropriating more money for the Indian Wars, when in fact, Crazy Horse was sitting in his teepee on the reservation with not a gun or a horse to his name. And so in our time, in my time, during, when I was in the Air Force during the Vietnam War, it was the Pentagon Papers released by Daniel Ellsberg to the New York Times that told the story about how our government had created a fabrication in order to sell the Vietnam War to the Congress and to drag us into it. And then more recently in 2003, in shock and awe, when weapons of mass destruction was the excuse to go into war. And then even today, we hear the stories about Iran with their nuclear weapons. But even, even Secretary of War Leon Panetta 
the former so-called liberal congressman from California, acknowledges that there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iran. But this is the MO, the modus operandi of the military industrial complex. I live in Bath, Maine, where Navy Aegis destroyers are built at Bath Iron Works. And these naval ships are being outfitted with missile defense systems. Uh, just yesterday, I was given a tour by one of the activists in San Diego. They took me on a cruise of the San Diego Harbor. Uh, we saw Aegis destroyers, uh, Aegis cruisers, again, outfitted with these missile defense systems. But one thing we saw really, really shocked me. We saw that the Navy now has two ships, two cargo ships, one called the Medgar Evers and the other called Cesar Chavez. I thought it was an, an abs absolute disgrace, absolute disgrace. But anyway, these US Navy Aegis destroyers made where I live in Bath, Maine, today are being used to surround Russia and China. When Bush was president, you might recall, he said he was going to deploy one particular <coughs> version of so-called missile defense in Poland and in the Czech Republic. But then when Obama became president, he rejected that deployment plan, and some people began to cheer. I was not cheering, and some people called me and said, Bruce, why aren't you cheering? Obama has you know, declared that he's not going to go forward with these deployments, and I said, we've got to watch the, both of the magician's hands. You can't just watch one hand. And soon thereafter, Obama announced a different deployment plan for missile defense with new ground-based interceptors in Poland, in Romania, uh, a radar system in Turkey, probably very likely one in Georgia on Russia's southern border. At the same time, Obama is deploying these missile defense systems on board these Aegis destroyers in the Black, Baltic, and Mediterranean seas, essentially beginning an encirclement of Russia. At the same time, NATO is expanding into Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, right on Russia's border, and into other countries in the former Warsaw Pact. You should know that when the Soviet Union dissolved, uh, Secretary of State Jim Baker of the King George I administration <laughs> promised uh, Gorbachev that NATO would never expand eastward one centimeter. But when Bill Clinton became president, he, he violated that promise and began moving NATO eastward in this beginning encirclement of, of Russia. Of course, Russia is now freaking out as they see NATO and the United States surrounding them. They're saying that they're likely going to pull out of the New START treaty that uh, Obama negotiated with Russia where they had modest uh, nuclear reductions. And you might remember that soon after Obama became president, he went to Prague in the Czech Republic where he announced a reset of uh, 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 relationships with uh, the former uh, Soviet Union and that he said we were going to try to get rid of nuclear weapons. So why then is the United States today, why is the Obama administration today encircling Russia and China? Why are we doing that? What's the reason? In the case of Russia, could it be that Russia holds the world's largest supply of natural gas and significant supplies of oil? And does anyone doubt that the real role of our military today is a, res a resource uh, extraction and control mechanism for uh, global corporations. China is also being surrounded with these missile defense systems today. Ground-based launchers are being deployed in Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and just last week it was announced that they're going to be put in Okinawa. Navy Aegis destroyers with, again, missile defense systems on board are being put into Japan, South Korea, Australia, Guam. Uh, they're now negotiating with Vietnam, Singapore, and others in the region to allow these US ships to port in their nation. And the Navy is now building, uh, excuse me, and now a Navy base is being built by the South Korean government on Jeju Island in South Korea, 300 miles from the coast of China. Jeju Island, a pristine envir environmental island, a UNESCO uh, 
World Heritage Site on, uh, in several particular places. But on the south side of the island is a little village called Gangjon Village, a 450-year-old fishing and farming community. I've been there three times now, and the people there uh, just uh, are devastated by this Navy base that is being built there on behalf of the United States government. When I called the South Korean Embassy in Washington and I urged others on my mailing list to do the same and I heard from several other people that called and they were all told the same thing by the South Korean, Korean uh, people in, in Washington DC at the South Korean Embassy. Don't call us, call your government. They're forcing us to build this place. Just offshore is a unbelievable soft endangered uh, soft coral reef is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Uh, it's going to be destroyed as the waterway is dredged in order to deepen the channel to allow the U.S. Aegis destroyers and the aircraft carriers and the submarines to come into port. The beautiful rocky coast where people have uh, worshipped nature and worshipped their, their past relatives uh, for this 450 years of the life of the village is now being blasted and they're going to cover it in concrete. Uh, uh, covering the endangered red crabs that live within the rocks, the, the fresh water that comes up uh, from underneath the rocks as well will be covered by the cement. And people have been organizing for five years in that community to try to stop this uh, travesty from happening. They've been going to jail in great numbers. And in, in uh, South Korea, there's a remarkable, remarkable Catholic community. Catholics are 40% of Koreans, and priests and nuns from all over Korea have been coming to Jeju Island, protesting against this Navy base, going to jail in, in uh, large numbers. Just yesterday, uh, five uh, priests were arrested for busting a hole in the fence that surrounds the, what they call the destruction area, where the Samsung Corporation, the lead contractor that is building this base, is now destroying this community. A boycott has been declared of Sam Samsung. I hope all of you will remember that and uh, please pass the word about that as well. The village asked the Global Network, our organization, uh, to come and hold our annual meeting there this year. Every year we hold an annual meeting in a different part of the world. We went there in February. We had people come from 13 different countries. and. Uh, so we met uh, first at a museum near the village. Uh, it's called the 4-3 Museum, April 3rd, which was yesterday. Yesterday was the 64th anniversary of a massacre on Jeju Island. You know, the, uh, at the end of World War II, when the United States uh, defeated the imperialist, imperialist fascist Japanese, uh, they were driven out of Japan, where they had occupied brutally the Korean people for many, many years. And in, the, in their place, the United States military put the former collaborators with the Japanese fascists in charge of Korea. And this created a dynamic within Korea that led to the Civil War, the Korean War. Because, you know, uh, half the country didn't want these collaborators uh, to be in charge, uh, these hated collaborators to be in charge of their nation. And the people on Jeju Island were very independent. And they were accused uh, of the United States and their collaborators of being communist. And so the United States military instructed the new South Korean government to go in and uh, put these people down. And more than 30,000 of them were massacred over a period of about a year or two by the South Korean forces under the full direction of the United States military. Well, a remarkable museum, a uh, heartbreaking museum we uh, witnessed. And we had our annual meeting there inside of, that, inside of that museum in order to make this connection. Because as a result of this history of Jeju Island, what happened was the Korean government a few years ago declared that Jeju Island was the peace island as a way to kind of apologize, if you will, for this massacre of the people. And now here you have this irony of the Peace Island having a Navy base be built in order to help the United States surround China in the years ahead. 
Well, when I came back, well, first let me say that 16 of us were arrested for um, trying to get onto what they call Gurumbi Rock. And uh, they've now put razor wire all the way down to the shoreline and, in fact, now out even into the water because the villagers keep trying to get out to Gurumbi Rock. They go in kayaks, and if they have to, they even swim because sometimes the uh, police come in in huge numbers. Our last day there, about 1,500 police were there, surrounded the kayaks, and they had a 14-hour struggle between the villagers and the police trying to dislodge their kayaks so they could get to Gurumbi Rock. But a couple days before, uh, they took us all out there on kayaks, and 16 of us were arrested for crawling under the razor wire to get onto Gurumbi Rock. When I came back, I was highly motivated because I'd never seen a community of activists anywhere like these people. I've never seen more determined people. I've never seen such stronger, nonviolent fighters in my entire life. And I felt that it's important that other people go there and see these people in action. And so I came back and I, uh, I'm a member of Veterans for Peace. We found two members of, two leaders of Veterans for Peace that were willing to go. I sent out an email to my list and I said, please donate so I can send these two people there. Well, we raised $10,000 in a week enough for six people to go, and so we immediately th sent three members of Veterans for Peace to Jeju Island. And when they got off the plane, they were met by the immigration people who had their picture in their hands, and they apprehended them, put them on airplanes, and sent them home. And so, not to be deterred, we said, we're not gonna uh, let them get away with this. We found another member from Veterans for Peace. We found another way uh, to get them in the country. We got them there now. And now we're working on sending other people as well, and we're going to continue to send people. And I'm asking everyone, as I go forward on this speaking tour, to have a discussion in your community about Jeju Island, learn more about it, and please consider sending someone from your community as well to this place. Why is Jeju so important? Let's talk about that for a moment. You might know that recently Obama announced that U.S. was going to pivot its foreign and military policy away from the Middle East toward the Asia Pacific region. Well, this is not a new development. It's been underway for a long time. In 2001, the Washington Post had a story called, for the Pentagon, Asia moving to the forefront. And the article said that the U.S. was now going to double its military presence in the Asia Pacific region. And that means that we need more ports of call, more bases, and that's why we're seeing the Navy base being built on Jeju Island. You might uh, remember that just very recently, Obama paid a visit to Australia where he negotiated a deal to send 2,000 Marines to Darwin on the north side of Australia as the U.S. is now doubling its military presence in the region. Why? Who's the enemy? Well, it's China. The United States has determined that we really can't compete with China anymore economically. But if we control China's access to resources, then we will control the keys to their economic engine, that we will be able to manage China. A very dangerous, a very provocative, and a very expensive strategy they're now uh, beginning to implement. Uh, China imports 60% of their oil today on ships. And if you look at the, a map when you go home, you'll see that the Yellow Sea and Jeju Island, just off the, the tip of the Korean Peninsula, uh, Jeju Island sits essentially at the gateway of the Yellow Sea, where China brings its oil on ships. So the U.S. wants to develop a strategic post there where they would have the ability to interdict and essentially choke off China's importation. The U.S. Space Command, the military command in charge of giving the United States control and domination of space, annually has been doing a war game set in the year 2016 called the Red Team versus the Blue Team. And in this war game, the United States launches a first strike attack on China, using the military space plane now under development as the first weapon in this first strike attack. The space plane flies down from orbit, drops a devastating attack on China, either nuclear or conventional weapons it could carry, and then goes back up into space. And then following that first strike at attack by this military space plane, other U.S. technologies are used to attack China. 
China admittedly today has 20 nuclear missiles capable of hitting the west coast of the United States. And in this first strike attack, the U.S. is trying to take out China's 20 nuclear missiles. But inevitably, we don't get all of them. And so in the war game, computer war game at the Space Command, China then fires its remaining retaliatory capability in a response. And it is then that the U.S. missile defense systems on board the Aegis destroyers and at ground-based sites, again in Taiwan, Japan, Okinawa, South Korea, take out this Chinese retaliatory strike. So essentially, the U.S. lunges forward with the first strike, a, a sword, into the heart of China. And then when China tries to respond, the U.S. uses the missile defense shield to pick off any retaliatory strike. And so that is why missile defense should not be called defense. It should be called missile offense. And it should be clearly understood that these systems are part of U.S. first strike. <laughs>